And Bernice, since it looks like it may be a, a smaller group, or, or do you think we have um, the capacity if you know there was a little back and forth if I posed a question and called in a couple people or? Absolutely. It's, I mean, I, I think those are more fun that way. Um, I put your polls in the, uh, in this list of polls here. Okay. Perfect. I think I also said, I'm not sure if I, let me just make sure that you're also, a, you are a uh, co-host. So. Should we admit everybody now? Uh, yeah, I was just testing out that I could log in on another place just in case. Sure, let's do it. This. Oh, I need it. It's great to see you again. Yep, good to see you again as well. Thanks for joining today. Welcome. Watch this. We're not playing. They're gonna watch us. No, we don't need your computer. So just for a little while, I'm gonna mute everybody while we do introductions. And then in a little while, uh, we can open that up so everybody can start to um, can start to to uh, communicate. Barnes, you, you are muted as well. I noticed, yes, I noticed that, yep. All right. You muted everyone, okay. sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Well, what's funny is that we both muted everybody at the same time, so that's why you muted me. <laughs> All right, so why don't we go ahead and get started then? It's um, a couple minutes after, so... Um, so let's do some intros. Right. I'm happy to get this event started tonight. Well, first of all, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Irene Porro. I am a director of the Krista McCullough Center at Framingham State University. And I'm super excited tonight to be here and welcome you all to yet another event uh, in, the, in the group of events for our science festival that is called Science on State Street. Planet Earth edition. Uh, the festival is started April 12, but will continue for a few more days until the 24th. So I welcome and invite all of you to check our website for future events. Tomorrow is very rich, but all for the rest of the, of the week. And I will post in a moment in the chat the link to these uh, um, events, but you can see it also here on the slide. But the reason why I'm so excited tonight to be here is because this is a really, really a special talk. Uh, the focus is on planet Earth. And what is more exciting to discuss than dinosaurs? Planet Earth, ancient Earth, and dinosaurs, and most of all, our, we think, soon, uh, officially, right, uh, confirm state, Massachusetts state dinosaur. So I am as excited as everybody else I, I heard earlier <laughs> in the in the when we first logged in to hear the story and, and the updates in this process. So thank you so much. And I'll post the link to the other events in the chat. Great, thank you. And now I will uh, hand it over to state representative. Jack Lewis, who, uh, for those of you who live in the Framingham area, he might just be your state rep. And, and he's the one who started this whole initiative. Thank you so much, Barnes, for that introduction. Uh, as he said, my name is Jack Lewis and I serve as a state representative. Uh, and if we were all in a classroom together, I would ask, 
what does that even mean? Uh, so actually, I will pose that question to all of you. Do any of you have any guess what my job is? I'm a state's representative. And if you want to use your raise, uh, is it Georgia Adele? Do you want to? Uh, what What do you think a state representative does? Um, I think that a state representative like represents the state. Good. I yes. Uh, so a big part of my job is that I am elected to represent the people that live in my communities. Uh, so yes. Any other guesses? I'm scrolling. Looking. Well, that is spot on. So maybe we only needed one answer. Uh, so I'm elected by the people that live in Framingham and Ashland. Uh, and a big part of my job is to vote on things like our laws in Massachusetts. And so everything from uh, the classes you need to take to graduate high school, to laws around uh, no texting while driving, uh, all of those laws we get to pass in Boston, uh, my colleagues and I. Uh, but another big part of what we do uh, is we get to uh, collect taxes. And so your parents can uh, maybe chime in maybe, or not, maybe chime in at this point. Uh, but taxes are a way where we all pay a little bit of money uh, when we work uh, or if we own a home. And then that money goes to the state to decide how it's spent. And so a lot of that money goes to pay for your schools. Uh, a lot of that money goes to pay for universities like Framingham State. Uh, oh, Georgia has her, your hand up again. So is it like bills, like house bills? Yes, yeah, so bills are like proposed laws. Uh, so before a law becomes a law, someone has to have an idea. Uh, and that idea is written down in a bill. Uh, and so we're jumping ahead, but that's great. Uh, one of the things I learned when I first became a state rep is that in addition to voting on things like what your parents' taxes are going to be uh, or what you need to study in school, one of the fun things that my colleagues and I get to vote on are our official state things. So we have an official state insect. It's the ladybug. We have an official state cookie. It's the chocolate chip cookie. We have an official state muffin, which is the corn muffin. Uh, we have an I flash all my favorite foods. I know it. Like we have official state beverage, uh, cranberry juice. We have an official state dog. I do love corn muffins too, Irene. Uh, an official state dog, which is uh, the Boston Terrier. Uh, so I was looking through this list, getting hungry uh, and getting excited about all of my favorite animals and and foods, uh, and I realized that. While we had an official state fossil, uh, which is the dinosaur footprint, uh, we did not have an official state dinosaur. And so at first I thought, well, there must not have been any dinosaurs in Massachusetts. If we had a dinosaur, then of course we'd have an official state dinosaur. Uh, but then I remembered that if we have official state dinosaur footprints as our official state fossil, then there must have been dinosaurs that lived here. And so I reached out to a bunch of paleontologists, uh, people who study dinosaurs and the prehistoric world. And I reached out to a bunch of museums like the Museum of Science. And I said, why don't we have a state dinosaur? And will you help me to find one? And so in addition to all of the other fun things I do with my job, uh, I decided to start this journey of learning about the dinosaurs we have found in Massachusetts, uh, learning about the people who discovered them, and hopefully, if you all can help me out, uh, we can name an official state dinosaur. But first, before we keep talking about dinosaurs, I want to make sure that I'm not the only one on this call who likes dinosaurs. So I'm gonna launch a poll, uh, which will pop up on your screen. And the question is, have you ever seen the movie Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, 
or any other dinosaur movies. We're talking Land Before Time. Uh, and if you have, answer yes. And if you have never seen a movie about dinosaurs, you can feel free to answer no. Uh, Georgia? I haven't like watched a movie, but I watched the old show called Dinosaurs that my the, mom and dad mama. used to watch when they were little. Not the mama, not the mama? Is that the, the little baby? And yes, yes. I watched that when yes. I was little as well. Uh, I'm actually sitting in my childhood bedroom where my parents 18 years ago shut the door and everything is exactly where I left it, including some of my dinosaur toys. Uh, so uh, I like 83% of you uh, have watched movies about dinosaurs, Dinosaur Train Counts. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who participated in the poll. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and officially end it. Uh, but this is sort of how we uh, decided which of our two dinosaurs uh, that, that uh, Barnes is gonna talk about in a little bit. Uh, that we are trying to get to be named our official state dinosaur. So, uh, doo -doo -doo, I'm sorry, I'm gonna put down the poll there. Uh, so we have discovered two dinosaurs in Massachusetts. Hopefully soon, paleontologists will find a couple more. Uh, but we have discovered two dinosaurs in Massachusetts. Uh, and I invited people, like all of you, uh, to vote in a poll to decide which of the two dinosaurs uh, was deserving of the title of our official Massachusetts state dinosaur. And that dinosaur was the holy, that's not right, Podokosaurus holiokensis. Uh, every time I say the name, I'm worried that uh, a paleontologist is gonna correct me. Uh, but 35,000 people voted in a poll and the great majority of them uh, agreed that the uh, Podokosaurus uh, deserved to be named our official state dinosaur. Uh, what's really special about this dinosaur is that it was about the size of a chicken. Uh, it lived in the Triassic period, uh, but even more special than that, uh, it was discovered by a woman, uh, a female paleontologist, uh, oh my gosh, about a hundred-ish years ago, uh, but she was the first woman to discover and name and describe, this is scientific language, uh, but to describe uh, a dinosaur. And when she found it, she didn't at first know what it was. Uh, and she worried because women a hundred years ago uh, weren't very common in the field of paleontology. Uh, but even though there was great resistance to her uh, publishing her study and uh, celebrating her find, uh, she did it. Oh, the other dinosaur, I'm seeing some comments here, is the Ankysaurus, oh, Barnas, help me. The Ankysaurus, what was the other dinosaur's name? <laughs> well, they, they, are, they are Anchisaurs, so there you go, Ankysaurus. And uh, a lot of dinosaurs you'll find have multiple pronunciations, depending on who you ask. So it's within that group. And if you ask me, I'll probably mispronounce it. But, uh, but yeah, so what I'm doing right now is trying to convince my colleagues, the other state representatives and the other state senators to support our state dinosaur bills. Uh, and a way they can do that is adding their names, being a co-sponsor of the bill. Uh, and my hope is that sometime in the next year, my colleagues, the other people I work with, will vote just like so many of you voted on helping to decide what our official state dinosaur was gonna be, that they will also vote and we'll make it official. Uh, and there'll be a big ceremony and music and uh, maybe even an unveiling of a big statue uh, of the Podokosaurus. Uh, but, but I need your help to do that. Uh, so one of the questions I have uh, in my last poll before I hand things over is, so you're getting to know me. If you live in Framingham or Ashland, uh, there's a good chance I'm your state representative. Um, actually, Barnes, we'll skip this poll, but I'm gonna drop in the uh, chat a link so that you and your parents can figure out using your address who your state representative is. Uh, and if you want, you can send them an email. Uh, I get many, many emails from kids and, I, and teachers. I love getting emails 
from kids and teachers. Uh, and I know that your state representative and state senator will as well. Uh, and you can just write them an email and say hi, introduce yourself, and ask that they support the state dinosaur bill. Uh, but I am having so much fun uh, learning about dinosaurs. Uh, like some of you, when I was little, I, I loved them. Uh, and my, my toys have been sitting on the shelf for about 30 years. Uh, but this project has reminded me of how important the study of STEM and STEAM is. Uh, it's also reminded me of the important role that the states that Massachusetts can play uh, in supporting the, the study of science uh, and the important work that goes on at Framingham State. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Barnes. but if you have any questions uh, later, make sure you uh, remember them and I will stick around to answer them later. Okay, thank you, Representative Lewis. I really appreciate that. Um, so just to, just to make sure that we have enough time at the end, uh, I was gonna play you this really awesome thing that we have that, that just came about a, a few weeks ago, which is called, uh, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna advance the slide to the next slide here. It's called the, the state, dinosaur, the official state dinosaur song, the Padoki, the swift-footed lizard of Holyoke song by uh, a folk musician named Terry Kitchen. And, what I'll do is at the end, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see, hopefully there'll be some time and I'll play that, but I'll also throughout, I'll tell you a, a few links on our website that you can go to uh, where you can find some of the resources that we're talking about, including, I'll show you one on the next slide, but first I wanna say, if you go to our website, which is called statedino.org, and the reason we chose that is because Padokasaurus.com might be too hard, or Padokasaurus.org might be too hard to spell. So uh, if you go to statedino.org, you can find a big link right up on top that mentions our state dinosaur song, and you can download it as a karaoke version and do your own Padoki karaoke. And if you give us a, ver a recorded version of it, we'll put it on the website. And I think that's really awesome. So, uh, I uh, was asked not to show you the poll, but I will just say, uh, if you do know your state legislators, you should write to them, as Representative Lewis said. Um, and the, the way you might wanna do that is there's a, uh, a link on the top of our website now, which is uh, right across the, the educator resources page called find your legislator or look up your legislator. And if you click on that link and you click on the map, you can find who represents you. So with that, I just wanna get us started off with something cool and exciting. So a lot of you, 80 something percent of you mentions that you've seen a dinosaur movie. So you've all seen, everybody has seen some giant dinosaur like this, right? Everybody, everybody has, yes, great. So as Representative Lewis said, the, the thing about our dinosaur is it's, it's, not, it's not exactly a giant T-Rex, now is it? It's, it's kind of, the way it's been described, it's a tiny little dinosaur. But I wanna assure you, tiny little dinosaurs are just as cool as the big ones. Um, so uh, what I, I had just mentioned, this, uh, this link, Mass Legislator, find your state legislator. This you can easily find on statedino.org. You don't have to remember this big long, long link. So just be sure to write down statedino.org. Okay, we have one question. Let's, let's address one, Georgia. So, um, so I, I looked at the website and mm -hmm. my, um, my legislator is, um, representative Brian M. Ash and the senator is Eric P. Lesser and, um, um, uh, my mom and dad used to go to school with the senator. Wow. When they were wow. Little. Well, you got a thumbs up from representative Lewis. So I think he'll, he'll be, he'll be reaching out if he hasn't already. Thank you. Thank you for looking that up so quick. So we don't need to do this poll because Representative Lewis already told you, but I just, just for the heck of it, I'm going to just whip it out on the screen. I'm going to launch this poll just to make sure everybody's paying attention. So does everybody know who our state dinosaur is now that it was already mentioned to you? Okay. I'm glad people are paying attention. We don't have a state dinosaur. Okay. I see somebody clicked on that. And there is a good reason why I put that option on there. 
And only, it looks like, okay, somebody said Anchosaurus. So some, one, and someone else said Tyrannosaurus. So they're either, it's wishful thinking or a couple people were snoozing during the beginning of the presentation. But I do wanna say one important thing, and that is two people, in my opinion, technically gave the right answer, which is currently we don't have a state dinosaur. So those two people are paying the most attention, I would say. Um, right now, as Rep Representative Lewis said, it is currently a, uh, not a law, but it's been proposed. So it, if you all help out, if you all write to your, uh, your representatives and your state senators, then we might have a state dinosaur. So I'm just gonna show that, show those results to you. And 13 of you said Podokosaurus and two of you said, we don't have a state dinosaur. So we know that our state dinosaur is Podokosaurus holyokensis, named after the town Holyoke. And as I mentioned on the bottom of our educational resources link, there's that find my legislator uh, uh, link that you can go to that website. But I'll, I'll, I'll get back to more information about the Podokosaurus. And I'll just tell you why I'm here today. So when I was a little kid, maybe your age, maybe a little bit older, maybe a little bit younger, I loved dinosaurs, uh, just like Representative Lewis. And I actually went out and, and thought that this was gonna be my, my long-term career. And I went out and started digging at a very young age. And this was maybe in elementary school, I really started thinking about it. So this, this uh, nerdy young little kid here in the bottom right here, that's me actually. Uh, and on the same day, see, I got the same shirt on. I, I actually was at Egg Mountain, Montana with uh, a famous paleontologist and they let me use a, a jackhammer to chisel into the ground. So believe it or not, that's actually a kind of a paleontological technique. Isn't that kind of dangerous? <laughs> it is It is kind of dangerous, yes. So if you do plan to jackhammer for some fossils, I do suggest you have a, a great big person around to help you, an adult, like I did. It was so like our person. dad. Yeah, exactly, uh, or, or anybody. Could, could even be your mom. My mom would love to, to uh, take a, a jackhammer and dig some fossils. Definitely not my grandma. She wouldn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, uh, also, if you do that, you could break the dino bone. That is a very good point. And I'm glad you said that. That's a fantastic and, and interesting point, is that nowadays, because of advances in technology, more paleontologists are using really advanced uh, analytical or equipment type techniques to look at fossils instead of digging them all the way out of the ground. Because often what happens is when you dig them up with some, even if you're just using a, a, a screwdriver or a little, uh, a dental pick some, or toothpick even, sometimes you can break a fossil, a really delicate one. So when I was a kid, I used all sorts of fancy equipment. This is a scanning electron microscope. Uh, where I looked at dinosaur eggshells. So this thing in the upper left here is a uh, part of an eggshell. And I ended up going to lots of science fairs and I won the World Science Fair uh, first prize uh, twice for a project on dinosaurs. And it was specifically studying how did dinosaurs evolve and what did they become? And, and I'm gonna give away, uh, I, I don't really even need to put up a poll about this because I believe so strongly in this that I, I just wanna go out there and say it. but. The, the birds you see today, when you look outside your window, those actually are dinosaurs. So most scientists would agree with what I'm saying right now. Dinosaurs and birds are really the same thing because they evolved into birds very, very early on. Yep, there's a question, yeah? Real quick. Me? Yeah, yeah, you, Georgia, real quick. So, um, so, if birds are birds, um, if birds are dinosaurs, then what about like lizards and like? Excellent question. So a lot of these uh, reptiles you see where you see dinosaurs uh, in, in certain uh, poses where they, they try to represent what, a, what does a dinosaur look like in real life? Well, a lot of them, they, were, they seem to be dragging their tail like a lizard because everybody thought dinosaurs were related to lizards, were related to reptiles. But actually, nowadays, when we show a dinosaur on the screen, we usually show it with its tail sticking up, like a bird with its tail feathers sticking straight up. And that's because we, nowadays, we more believe that dinosaurs 
are, are actually much more like birds than they are like, like lizards. So I went on uh, in my career, I went on in my career and I, I uh, ended up doing a lot with technology and a lot with paleontology. And I've also spent a lot of time writing. So today I'll just tell you a couple things from, from some of my books, but I will give you the opportunity to have a totally free book today because Earth Day is tomorrow. And some of what I'm going to talk about has to do with climate change and has to do with how uh, the environment has changed from the days of the dinosaurs until the days of, of, uh, of now. And you can learn more about it with this free book. It's a totally free ebook and it's hundreds of pages. And we're absolutely crazy to give it away for free, but we're going to do that. Um, and I'll, I'll show you, there's a link on, on the website that I'll, I'll point you to at the end. So as uh, Representative Lewis said, I don't have to repeat everything, but um, uh, Minyan Talbot was the paleontologist who discovered the Podokosaurus. Uh, she was very famous because she was the chair of geology at Mount Holyoke and had discovered this brand new species at a time when uh, her doing so, her doing that was, was really very unlikely. And the sad thing about this that, that Representative Lewis didn't mention in his talk was the fact that that dinosaur, that, that fossil disappeared because it was stored away in a building that caught on fire and the building got completely destroyed. And with it, the whole, when the whole building fell down, the fossil was on the very bottom of all that rubble. They never recovered it. So it's very, very sad. But the good thing about this and, and my message is technology. And at the time, the best technology they had was taking photographs. And, and using, uh, using different chemicals to make what they call mold. So to make a replica, a, a, a fake version of that fossil. And they did that. They made a fake version of the Podokosaurus in plaster and they, and they took lots of photographs of it. So actually we know what that fossil looked like. We have a really good idea of what that fossil looked like because of the technology that was available at the time. And they, they did a really good job of recording it. So. There is a, a, a cast and this is a picture of it. So the picture I just showed, this is a picture from long ago of the original Podokosaurus, our state dinosaur or so, soon to be state dinosaur. And this is what the cast looks like. So what's, what's really cool about our state dinosaur website is that now you can actually go on our website and get a very, very detailed view. So can everybody see this video? This is just a really quick video of what the three-dimensional version of this fossil looks like. So we made this into a 3D model that if you go to statedino.org and you click on our 3D models uh, page, you can, you can actually navigate and look very closely at this fossil as if you're a real paleontologist right there, right in front of it. And in very high detail, you could do your own study. Maybe you can find some, some hidden thing that we never saw before. And that actually happens in paleontology all the time. So it'd be great if all of you could, could do your own. I see your a green dot. I'm sorry. I see a green dot. You see a green dot. What does that mean? I saw a green dot on the fossil. A green dot on the fossil, on the fossil. Okay, great. Well, I'll tell you what, when you go on the website later on, maybe today, and, and check it out. And if you find something interesting, then go back on the contact page of our website and let us know. And we will definitely, we'll look it up. So, um, so technology is a way that as paleontologists, we can advance science. We can make science go a little bit better and a little bit faster than it used to because for hundreds of years, the best we had in paleontology was taking a hammer and a chisel and, and you know, smacking into some rocks and, and just looking at these rocks. So now we can do so much more than we ever could before. This is what I was just mentioning, where a lot of the, the ideas that early paleontologists had were centered around the, the idea that reptiles might have been related to dinosaurs. So that's why the tail of this Podokosaurus from the early 1900s actually looks like it's dragging, which is really not the way it, it probably was in real life. It probably was sticking way out. So here's an interesting uh, piece of art that was done by probably one of the, the in, in the, on the handful of the most famous paleontologists in the world, 
when this guy was a, a grad student, he did this piece of art and he put the Pedocosaurus on the head of a very famous statue of David because it, to him, Pedocosaurus was so important. And he did this in 1964 before anybody had even conceived of the idea of a Massachusetts state dinosaur. So this is an actual model of what that skeleton of the Pedocosaurus would have looked like, or that's the way it was, it was thought in the 1900s. But based on what I've, I've just been saying to you, this is a much more accurate restorate, what we call a restoration, which is uh, how we believe that it would look like in real life. So as, as you can see, there's a big difference between this guy who looks like a, a chicken who had all of its feathers taken off, right? And then this guy looks like he's part way towards becoming a, 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 a full on bird, right? And he's got feathers all over the place and he's, he's even got uh, chicken feet. So this is what we now as, as paleontologists believe probably the Pedocosaurus might've might have looked like. And part of that is because uh, one other thing I didn't mention before was that while we found a great and well-preserved fossil of Pedocosaurus, it didn't have a head. So the best that we can do now is just think about what the, does the body of the dinosaur look like and what does it look most similar to in terms of other dinosaurs. So it actually looks like another dinosaur called Coelophysis or Coelophysis, depending on, again, who, who you ask how to pronounce it. And this is what its head looked like. So when you go to our website, you'll find we have a lot of uh, downloadables and a lot of files. And they're actually Coelophysis files because we think that that is the dinosaur that probably looks most closely like the Pedocosaurus. So here's a couple of different you know, skeleton uh, comparisons here. You can see Pedocosaurus and you can see Coelophysis and how they really look pretty similar in these, uh, in these, recon in these uh, drawn reconstructions. So as I just mentioned, you can find files like this on, on the statedino.org site. And this is cool because this also a lot is like a virtual reality fossil, lets you look at all the different angles and the different parts of the, of the bones. So um, this is a silophysis that has an actual head on it. So it's a pretty good, pretty probably pretty close idea of what the Pedocosaurus head would have looked like. And this is a picture of uh, a, a 3D printed coelophysis that we have made available to you on our website that you can download, that you can print if you have a 3D printer or if you have a library that, that has a 3D printer or a makerspace, then you can do that too. Actually, we, we have a few teachers in Massachusetts who are planning on doing that with their students. So if you know, if, you, if your library or your school has a 3D printer, please ask them and, and try and print it out. And if you paint it up and take a picture of it, again, we'll put it on our website and, and we'll show it to the world. And, and if Representative Lewis really, really likes it, he might even bring it to the state house. You never know. So here's a question. I'm not gonna put it in the poll. I'm just gonna just leave it open. What do you guys think the Pedocosaurus used to eat? And there's some clues based on the skeletons I just showed you. Anybody wanna? Take a guess. Just go ahead and unmute and, and, and shout it out. Um, I think he was an omnivore. An omnivore. Okay. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I think I agree with who just said omnivore. I think it's a carnivore, but I herbivore. Someone thinks it's a carnivore. A couple people think it was an omnivore. So I'll just, I'll just show you, this is probably, probably what a lot of its diet might've been like. So I know it's, it sounds yucky, right? But they probably love to eat bugs because bugs are pretty good protein, right? <laughs> and if you're, if you're a carnivore and a bug is just sitting there and easy to catch, I, I think that would be an easy meal for you. So it, it doesn't seem very much like the dinosaurs we're used to thinking about, like in, in uh, Jurassic Park movies. But some dinosaurs did eat bugs and little lizards. So when, when I was uh, in college and beyond, I did a lot of work in the field. So my work used to be on a specific period in time, uh, the Triassic, the, the early, early Triassic. So 
Uh, hopefully you guys all have a, a good sense of, of numbers by now. So this part of time was about 220 million years ago or so, something like that, the, the period in time that I studied. And, and this might be hard to see because I have my, my uh, green screen set up, but this is, this is about the size of, of the fossil that I'm laying down next to. This is a real one. Uh, this is a, actually, this is a, a, a 3D printed, but this is a, a real 3D print of that same fossil. And you can see when I put it up against me, it's actually much, much bigger than my head. And the amazing thing is, although this was in the time of the dinosaurs, there was a moment in time when these reptiles called the phytosaurs were actually bigger than dinosaurs. So even in the age of dinosaurs, there were reptiles that were bigger than, than dinosaurs. And, and as Representative Lewis said, if the Podokosaurus might have been around the size of a chicken or maybe even a turkey, uh, it, it would have been probably a good meal for a phytosaur around this time. So other work uh, that I had done was, was actually with a guy named Jack Horner. And uh, this guy here is, is known for being the Jurassic Park guy. He's the, the character that the book Jurassic Park and the movie Jurassic Park was based on. And he was also the chief science advisor uh, to the movies. So when they made the movie, this was the guy they asked, how should we make the movies? How should we, what should we do to make the dinosaurs look realistic? So he was very famous for uh, uh, work that he had done where he found the babies of, and, and the eggs of, of a certain type of dinosaur. And this dinosaur was called the Mayasaura. And this is a picture of it right here. And obviously they were like, you know, the prey of other dinosaurs. A lot of dinosaurs were eaten by other dinosaurs. And in this period of time, which is, uh, which is the Cretaceous period, they would have actually been the prey of something like a Tyrannosaurus rex. Does everybody like ty Tyrannosaurus rex? Anybody? Okay, I do see some hands. Excellent. I love them so much. <laughs> you love Dang. them so much. They are triumphant. I like awesome. Compsignathus. Oh, that's also, yeah, that's a very cool little dinosaur. Very similar to our own state dinosaur. So that said, uh, the movie Jurassic Park is based sort of on some science. And I guess I just wanna ask without putting up a poll necessarily, does anybody believe that Jurassic Park could be real or that it is real? Anybody, any hands, anybody? Nobody. Okay, I'm sad. I might be the only, is anybody Ew. raising their hands? Okay, sounds like I one do. person. You do, okay, all right. I see one, one, one person at least. So great, then I, I, I have a good friend because I believe that it is, oh, see, I, I see a couple more people joining, excellent. So the, the cool thing about Jurassic Park is it's based on this chemical, this biochemical, this part of, of your body, this, this piece of every cell in your body. And I guess I, I, I probably don't even need to ask you, but does everybody know on the bottom here, this chemical that I'm, I'm moving the mouse around it, Everybody know what that's called? I do. Everybody, let's go ahead and answer. I do. It's DNA. Awesome. 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 Yes, it is DNA. And, and the idea for, it sounds like many of you have seen Jurassic Park or, or Jurassic World or some movie like that. Um, the idea is that if you take DNA and you find, let's say, a mosquito that's stuck in fossil amber and you pull the DNA out of that insect that maybe was sucking the blood of a dinosaur, then maybe you could use that DNA to make a new dinosaur from scratch. So that's the idea. And it's a lovely idea. I mean, it's great for you know, scientists who wish they had their own pet dinosaur. But the problem with it is that DNA is a little tricky. So Maybe a lot of you know that uh, the, the COVID pandemic that we're all in, they have a, a vaccine now that's based on RNA, right? Which is kind of like DNA. It's a way to send messages. It's a way to, to create a code around uh, different chemicals in your body that make up who you are. So the problem with 
some of these chemicals. It's, it's obviously, it's very, very hard for them to make that vaccine for COVID. It's also very, very hard to take DNA, which is much, much bigger than a, a COVID virus uh, uh, genetic sequence and take that DNA and turn it into something that's alive. That's a very, very hard task to do. So I believe that doing it the way that they say so in the movie might be, mm, might be, might be hard, might be not likely right now. But I do believe that there is a way to do it. And, and so I put up on this screen, is it possible? Well, I believe it's possible. There's, there's right now a professor at Harvard University who is a geneticist and he actually has some DNA from extinct woolly mammoths and he's turning it into a living woolly mammoth by, by recreating some of the, the, uh, what the gene sequences used to look like, what the DNA used to look like and putting it into a living elephant and seeing if he comes up with a, a woolly mammoth. And he's very close. He's really close. So it is possible. And they are actually talking about making a thing called the Pleistocene Park, which is going to be in North Russia. And it's going to have a lot of these woolly mammoths. And I think it, it is very possible. I even think it's more possible uh, that we might have what's known as a Chickenosaurus very soon. And that will also be based on the idea that you could take a modern chicken and take its DNA and mess around with it a little bit, add some things, take out some things, and then make a living Chickenosaurus. And as of a few years ago, this slide shows that they're already well on their way to making tails in chickens and they can already make teeth in chickens. They can already make featherless chickens. And it won't be long now before they can make little pet dinosaurs. And maybe they're already doing it somewhere secretly off the coast of Dominican Republic like they did in Jurassic Park. It might be possible. So maybe it will be scary, right? But maybe there'll be a Chickenosaurus very soon. And actually the project behind the Chickenosaurus is, is also being led by that same paleontologist, Jack Horner, I mentioned a while ago. He's He's got it very well funded. So he probably could make a chickenosaurus very soon. So back to real paleontology. So when I went out in the fields, uh, it was kind of scary sometimes because you would look out, out into the distance and it's very hard to see these mountains, but this was Arizona. And, and if you look out in, in the distance, you might be looking tens or hundreds of miles away. And as you can see, this little dot in the middle of the screen, it might be hard to see, but this little dot is the car, the only car that we took on our expedition. And if that car broke down, it's gonna be a few hundred miles to, to walk home or worse, if something happened, break a leg or something, and, and you'd really have to have a, a, someone with a satellite phone to call. And back then, uh, there were no satellite, there weren't satellite phones when I first started doing paleontology. So the modern era of having cell phones everywhere is definitely great for, for paleontologists. So it is a tough life. It's hard to be a paleontologist. And that's another reason why we're using modern technology to make it a little bit better and a little bit faster. So this you can see looks pretty red, right? This is like a typical Grand Canyon sort of looking uh, 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 mound of dirt. And if you look a little closer at the base, you might see toward the bottom here, you might see uh, a little bit of a thing sticking up out of the ground. And if you look closer, you can clearly see that it's a dinosaur bone. Now I found this dinosaur bone in, uh, you know, on right on the surface. And that's not very common, but it is possible to find bones like this right out in the open and then if you're very careful, you can take it back and prepare it and you've got an amazing find. Like this was a, a leg bone of a phytosaur, not an amazing find, but a pretty good find. And I just wanted to talk about why that's important because Podokosaurus was actually found just like that, using that, that same process of walking around and looking on the ground and just, just observing and finding a fossil right there out in the open. So, this is an example of some of the technology that we're using nowadays to, to analyze bones and to analyze certain specific things that, that we wanna look at as scientists. And, and this 
is a technique that I encourage you guys to all learn about by going on our website. This is called photogrammetry. It's a big word. You're probably not going to remember it, but it is cool because you can make 3D pictures of bones and fossils and share them with your colleagues. And that's very important, especially during a pandemic when you can't travel as much and you can't go to places, but you want to still be able to research things. So Technology is really getting to the point where paleontology has so many tools that we can access that maybe you never even thought about before. But other things that we study also involve lots of technology. Now you might be scratching your head right now. You might be saying, why am I looking at a bunch of planets during a talk about dinosaurs? So I'm just gonna ask you, first of all, uh, hopefully everybody knows tomorrow's Earth Day. And because this is sponsored, this talk is sponsored by the, the Framingham State University and the McAuliffe Center, which is about space education. Hopefully, you all know your planets. Does everybody know these planets? Everybody? Anybody? Um, uh, I think I know um, uh, Venus, Pluto, Saturn, um, uh, Earth, um, what else? Ooh, Mars. There's, and then the white one is the Awesome. Okay, so you guys you guys, some of you guys know your planets. In the old days, we used to say, we used to say what we, we had a, a, a phrase that we would say to remember all the planets in order. We used to say, my very educated mother just sold us nine pizzas. And that's how you could remember all the planets. And unfortunately, there's no more pizzas because there's no more Pluto. So my very educated is Mar Mars, Venus, and Earth. So with that, I'm gonna show you a, a, a slide. Uh, I'm gonna first. I'm gonna show you this 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 cool tool that I think you guys should all, if you get a chance, you guys should all play with. I'm gonna I'm pu putting this link up in the chat later, but this is a tool for those of you who want to join a science fair or want to do a project. This is a tool that lets you look at the Earth and analyze the Earth for free, and you can do all sorts of different things to manipulate it. So you can actually see what happens in the climate, in the world at different times. And that is very cool. It's very cool that we can use modern computer technology to do things like this, because this lets us take lots and lots of data and, oops, and, and decide if all that data means something useful or doesn't mean something useful. So here, I'm, gonna, I'm just showing you some data real quick. This has Mercury, Earth, and Mars. And you know that because Mercury, Earth, and Mars are all kind of relatively close to the sun, but Mercury is the closest, you know that it should be hottest. Is that right? Everybody agree with me or don't, don't agree with me? Anything close to the sun should be hottest. Yes? And we, and we know that Mercury is closer to the sun than Earth. But no. let, let me just quickly say, what if, what if we threw in Venus? So remember I said my very educated mother, Mars, Venus, Earth, and uh, sorry, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars in that order away from the sun. So it's missing some data. This data set is missing some data and it's because it's missing Venus. But when I put that data back in, you can see there's a big problem. All of a sudden the data doesn't make sense. So can anybody just quickly explain briefly What's going on here? An idea? No idea? Okay, yeah. Yun Song? Yeah? It's pronounced Hyosep and Unsung. Okay. Venus is hotter because it has thick clouds and it's close to sun, but it's not the closest. That's, that is a great idea. Th thank you for, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so, the interesting thing about this graph, it shows that the temperature of Venus is so much higher than Mercury, even though it's farther away from the sun, it's because of, of global warming. It's because their planet is totally covered in an atmosphere, right? And I'm saying there, like as if there's, there's people on Venus, but there's, there's nothing, there's no, there's no life on Venus that we know of. But the fact is, all of the, the atmosphere on, on Venus is trapping all this energy and it's getting really, really hot. And this is something that has happened on Earth 
many times. And it's very important to think about that when you think about the dinosaurs, especially when you think about the Docosaurus and you think about being a paleontologist. So this right here is a picture of something that we call an ammonite. And you might know trilobites or you might know brachiopods or maybe you know clams at least, clam shells, seashells. A lot of these old, old fossils from a long time ago, they didn't seem to have very much color. They were kind of gray most often because they were buried deep, deep under the ocean. But then when you look in Arizona or you look somewhere out in, in the Southwest and you look at the dirt, the dirt there is really, really red and it's a lot more recent. Or for instance, if you look at the Podocosaurus slab that I showed you at the beginning, we call it the slab, it's kind of reddish brownish, right? Now, I guess the question would be, what do you think causes all of this? What do you, what could possibly be going on that, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can, I can share, a if I can put out a poll that asks you. I don't expect anybody's gonna guess this, but if you do, you are the genius of the day, if not the genius of the century, because it's a tough question. What does anybody think is causing all the redness in these rocks? All right, we've got a few answers. I'm gonna give you a couple more seconds. All right. Okay, I'm gonna just end it now. And it looks like a lot of people said carbon dioxide and a lot of people said oxygen. So there are many, many geniuses out there among us today, which is fantastic. So oxygen is what happened. Oxygen happened in our atmosphere at a time before the dinosaurs, but after we had all these like seashells and fish and squid and, and things like that ruling the world, somewhere in between there were plants that came up on land and started producing oxygen. And that was absolutely important for us as, as a planet because we needed to make sure that there would be oxygen for us to breathe. And, and actually that happened, you can see here in, in this chart, it happened where it says first land plants over 400 million years ago. And the fossil I just showed you a short while ago that the uh, phytosaur, that's from a little bit over 200 million years ago. And they're the first dinosaurs and mammals and birds. And the Podocosaurus was also kind of around that time frame, maybe a little bit later than the, the phytosaur I just showed you. And all of those animals needed oxygen. And at the same time, things like iron that are in the rocks, like you, you, if you leave a nail outside, will turn rusty. It will turn kind of red because of oxygen. Sometimes, you know, water gets on it too, but oxygen is what causes it to, to become red. And so it's really important in paleontology to understand that plants made a big difference in the ability for dinosaurs to evolve and lots and lots of other animals. And it also made a big shift in our atmosphere. And back when there were dinosaurs, there weren't companies producing lots and lots of pollution. So the dinosaurs actually probably had really clean air <laughs> to breathe. So you see that plant, that plant breathes in the CO2 and, and puts out oxygen that we now as people breathe. And you see this little frog sitting in the middle of a pond in the middle of some algae and weeds. Well. This frog came out just like uh, many of his relatives came out of the water and onto the land and started to breathe because there was already some air there. And so this is very important. There were so many amphibians that came before the reptiles and then after the reptiles became the, the age of the dinosaurs. So it, it is really, really interesting to think about evolution and think about it in these terms. So. The Podocosaurus, it was found around this number here, number 22. And this was a, a map that was done a long time ago in the early 1900s. And I, I went to Google and I overlaid a map to see where is, where would we find a Podocosaurus today? Well, unfortunately, most of it now is pretty built up. It's all, there's a lot of houses, there's a lot of buildings. So you, it would be very hard for you to go out in nature and find a Podocosaurus of your own. But I want you to keep up hope because the reason why Podocosaurus was found in the first place 
is because it was transported over a long time. So any, any place like this was a small patch of, of, uh, of land and right on top of it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even think that looking at this hill that there was a bunch of fossils, but, you know, but I went up on that hill and we found a whole bunch of fossils, like all right up here, all these fossils. So you can actually find fossils really anywhere if you look. And so, you know, maybe some of you have heard that different things killed the dinosaurs. Does anybody have an opinion what killed the dinosaurs? Anybody? Anybody want to share what they think about this? Nobody wants to share. <laughs> okay. I do. You do? Okay. Go ahead. Um, uh, usually, um, uh, I'm just saying, but it might be pretty hard because in a lot of shows and, and movies I watch, volcanoes and asteroids have shown it. So I think it must be both of them. It must be both of them. Okay. Oh, I'm choosing asteroid and meteor. Of course, I really don't know. Okay. So, yeah, I just decided to throw that slide up, that uh, poll up there. Um, but it's true, many of you are answering scientists don't know. And some of you are answering asteroid meteor. And it's really important to recognize that, that a lot of people are, are right here because there's really no way we can go back in time and be absolutely sure about what exactly, so I'm gonna share and show you what, what everybody else answered. So it's really not 100% sure what, what killed the dinosaurs, but I think it's pretty safe to say that we've all heard the theory that asteroids might've done that. And it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting to think about that in the sense that there's, there's a lot of evidence out there. There's many, many people who have found lots and lots of, of different clues that lead us to believe that maybe the one big event that killed a lot of these dinosaurs and not the Podokosaurus because the Podokosaurus came very early in the age of dinosaurs. It may have been that some giant collision happened just like this, maybe not so big because obviously <laughs> both of these things got completely obliterated, but it is very possible that something like that happened and created this big, void that created this, this problem where a lot of animals passed away and went extinct. And what happened afterwards was a series of, of evolutionary steps. Animals, many animals that, um, that were early mammals grew bigger, grew furrier. They got a lot of hair and there was an ice age. And the great thing about this is we know that the ice age caused a lot of, of rocks to be moved. So it's thought that when Minion Talbot was looking around in, in Holyoke, that what she found was a, a big boulder of a rock that had been transported from somewhere else. So it wasn't even from that area. It was maybe from not too far away. And we know that there are, there are other fossils in that area, but it might've been moved. So really, no matter where you are in Massachusetts, no matter where you are in the United States, or maybe some of you are not even in the US right now, uh, you can find a fossil. You can definitely find an important fossil no matter where you are. And obviously, since the Ice Age, we've had an evolution, of, an evolutionary spurt. We had primates evolve into mankind. And that happened in such a short period of time that now that's why we have paleontologists. And that's why we can scour the planet for fossils. And that's just really fun and fascinating. So I, I hope that uh, one thing that you guys think about is you know, in Massachusetts, you know, Representative Lewis mentioned all the other state things. We have state cookies, state flowers, all this other stuff. Well, we actually currently have a state fossil, and that is the state fossil known as dinosaur tracks. And some of these dinosaur tracks might have been deposited by, by dinosaurs we mentioned, so from anchosaurs, maybe even some pedocosaurs. But what's cool about that is there, we know that there are lots of other fossils out there. We know because there are dinosaur tracks and, the, and they're, they're definitely from one area of Massachusetts that we know that dinosaurs were walking on that very ground. So there are more pedocosaurs out there. That's a fact. And, and I'm hoping that some of you guys will get out there and, and find some more. Maybe you'll find your own species, right? And I really, I really hope that you do. I really hope that you do. 
But when you do that, when you go out there and dig, I hope that instead of pulling it out of the ground and showing all your friends, I hope that you can either take a picture of it, use your phone and, and tag where it is and with a GPS, and maybe mark the spot with what we call a cairn, which is this little thing on the bottom here that's a pile of rocks, something that nobody else will notice, but you'll remember. And then you can find that location again. And, and that's really why Minion Talbot was able to give us a state dinosaur is because she found this location, remembered where it was, took very careful notes, went back and was able to, to take it out of the ground with a crew, with a bunch of people. And the important thing was that she shared it with all of us. She shared it with all of us so we could all have it for generations and generations to come. So I hope that when you guys go out there and you guys want to go find some fossils that you, you think about those, those things that I just mentioned. And go to the website, download some 3D principles, make your own dinosaur fossils, learn about fossils in the meantime, and, uh, and, and give, us a, give us a shout on the statedino.org website and, and let us know what you find. So uh, I also hope that you'll download the, the, uh, the book that we put up because it has a lot of information that I, I mentioned today. Uh, yes, there's a question. And I just want you to know I'm done and now we can go on to, to questions. So um, there's, I see, is it uh, Leo? Yep, okay. Yes, Leo Castro. All right. Um, 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 uh, if, I, if I ever go out on the trying to look for a fossil, you know, one of the, it's a notified paleontologist, I'll obviously notify you when we do another tumble books. Okay, great. Because I don't know yeah. where how to reach you in the email. That's the problem. I don't know how to reach you in that, but but I can't tell you if I ever find any yet. I I hope you do. Uh, and honestly, if you go to statedino.org, there's like several different places you can click on to to reach us. Wow. So okay, all I'll of those will will eventually get to to one of us, and then we'll spread it to to the rest of us. Yeah. Yep. Thank there's you. another question. I'm I'm gonna click on ask to unmute, and you can feel free to. So, like, um, how do you know that the Podocosaurus has fur and how do you know it looks like that it has feathers and how, do you, and how do you estimate or guess what it looks like? Well, interestingly enough, we, the answer is we don't really know. So I'm going to go back and just show that, put that slide up. But the, the reason we think that's the case is because there actually have been in amber there have been dinosaurs that have, have died in, in a, a, a sticky plant sap, a sticky, sticky tree sap, and the feathers have been totally preserved. So we know that some small dinosaurs definitely did have feathers. And we also have impressions. So uh, for instance, uh, dinosaur footprints are impressions of where a dinosaur did step somewhere on, on some mud, but that just left a little impression. So feathers, usually because they're, they're not made of bone, they're, they're usually hard to preserve. But some places there are actually uh, preserved feathers. So, so we have found that. And so that's why many scientists believe that it's extremely likely that, um, that they look like this, that many dinosaurs look just like this. They, they're not, not really furry necessarily, but maybe different kinds of feathers. There was an, another question. I saw someone else had their hand up. Or did I fully answer your question? I'm sorry. I believe okay. Evan has uh, a hand up. Yep, I, I feel like Evan started to unmute. Um, um, what I was going to say is that, um, um, I'm going, I'm going to make a, when I'm older, I'm going to try and make an, um, a dinosaur sort of like the chicken source, something like that. Um, I'm going to make a um, Pupasaurus. You're going to make a real Pudokasaurus. That is, that is ambitious and I think um, that is awesome. What I meant is like a dog dinosaur. A dogosaurus. A dogosaurus rex. 
Awesome. Might be scary. Sometimes dogs are scary and dinosaurs are scary and a dog plus a dinosaur together might be twice as scary, but maybe it'll be cute. You never know. <laughs> if you want to do it, I say go for it. To follow yep, up there's on the question of like, what did Podokosaurus look like uh, in the chat, I, I mentioned, uh, but we're going to be doing uh, a contest of sorts. Uh, there's not going to be, you know, a first place person or anything like that. Uh, but there will be an opportunity for folks to submit artwork uh, where we're going to invite you to guess what a Podokosaurus looked like. And so are you going to give it feathers? Are you going to give it scales? Uh, and we're going to share, as, as Bernice said, a lot of those online, on social media. And when this pandemic is behind us, uh, we'll showcase some of them at the Boston State House or the, the Massachusetts State House in Boston. Uh, so for your parents or other adults in your life, I posted the social media links in the chat as well uh, for the state dinosaur. Uh, so urge folks to follow or like us there. Uh, we'll make sure we get the information out broadly, uh, but those are updated on a very regular basis as well. Uh, and when the contest is all up and running, uh, we will share the links as well. So uh, great questions, everyone, and uh, look forward to seeing some of the artwork you all put together. Uh, I noticed there was someone else who had asked, uh, started to ask a question. Go ahead. I, I just clicked on your thing. How do you know um, the, the feathers of the Podokosaurus are spotted? If you Ah, how do we know that they were spotted? Actually, that's something paleontologists don't have a clue about. <laughs> so there are some, there is some research. There are some people who believe that they can find uh, molecules, some pigment molecules, where they think that there might be an idea of some of the colors. And I don't think that anybody's really certain what colors dinosaurs were. Um, I, and I don't think anybody's really uh, even thinking that they, that they wanna make a claim <laughs> that they, they, they know for sure. But um, just when you look at modern animals and you see what they look like today, you look at you know, uh, rodents, uh, of different kinds. You look at, uh, let's say, uh, in this case, looking at this Podokosaurus restoration, let's say you look at a, a, a cheetah, or you're looking at a cat, or let's say you're looking at a bird. A lot of these creatures have markings on their, uh, on their fur or on their feathers today. And birds in particular have a lot of different variety of, of different colors and, and, and different types of patterns. And Around, around here, like in Massachusetts and New England, you know, a lot of the birds just are sort of either gray or brown. And, and a lot of them are like that because they, they wanna camouflage themselves. They wanna fit in in the background so you can't easily catch them. And those are usually the small birds. And then sometimes you have larger birds, like, you know, in, in the, in the uh, if, if anybody has seen uh, the movie like Rio or any of those movies where there's parrots that are multicolored or one bright color. Sometimes that's done so you can recognize someone else in your species. So there are different reasons why different animals have colors. And I, I think when people do restorations, they're just using their imagination. So as Representative Lewis said, the reason why it's a good idea to do an art gallery or an, an, an art competition or an art uh, celebration of some kind is because we want to see what your, where your imagination takes you. And, and all the creativity you have and see, what do you think dinosaurs could have looked like? Or what, what maybe the Podokosaurus looked like in terms of its colors or, or how, how many feathers it had. So please use your imagination. I know someone else had their hand up, but um, I'm gonna just ask you, if anybody has a question, just feel free to unmute yourself so that I, I don't have to just uh, click on your button. <laughs> to unmute you. Anybody else? Yeah. Does anybody have any awesome questions about the legislative process or how you can, you can also run for state rep in your area and one day have your own state thing 
whatever that thing is. As long as you're not running for state rep and framing it. So many of you, maybe when you grow up, you might want to be a paleontologist or do something to study science. Uh, but as he just said, if any of you have any interest in government, in, in politics, uh, in the legislative process, please never hesitate to reach out uh, to me as well. Uh, I'll drop my email in the chat. Uh, but really, and as you're, for those you know, who maybe are in high school or older, uh, our office and many other offices run internships, uh, which gives you a chance to uh, sort of try out the job and see what it's like uh, to be a state rep or, or uh, maybe even to be a paleontologist uh, and definitely happy to make those connections for you as well. Uh, but just so excited that you all uh, joined us this evening. Uh, I still love dinosaurs, even though I'm an adult, uh, as does Barnes. Uh, it's something that you don't have to grow out of and maybe you make it a job uh, and maybe it's something you continue to be interested in. And for me, I did not make dinosaurs a job, uh, but uh, I have gone to dig sites in places like Utah and Colorado, uh, a most recent family vacation in Australia. We drove a couple days into the outback to spend a day at a dinosaur dig site. Uh, and so definitely that love of dinosaurs continues. Uh, the question here, you have to be 18 to be a state representative. Uh, so for many of you, a couple more years, uh, but, but definitely don't hesitate to be in touch. Uh, and I'm just so grateful that you tuned in tonight. Great, so we're a little bit over time and unless anybody has any super urgent burning questions right this second, um, I, I'm, I just wanna make sure everybody thanks Representative Lewis, if you could all unmute yourselves and give him a great big round of applause because we would not have at least a bill to make a state dinosaur. And very soon, I believe we will have a state dinosaur. Yeah. There's a lot of silent clapping going on. There's a giant audience of silent clapping going on. <laughs> no. Oh. Thank you, Representative Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be learning from you. Thank you all for joining today. You're and, welcome, sir. And also, um, as, uh, as you heard in the beginning, uh, there's going to be more science on state street shows that you should all tune into because uh, I've, I've seen these before and, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be part of it. And I'm sure so is Representative Lewis but there are lots of other great people with lots of other great ideas and things to share. And I, I hope you all spend, the, spend some time learning, learning from, from all these, these great uh, webinars and, and classes that are going on that are totally free, that it's just so valuable. So thank, thank you all for showing up today. I appreciate that. Hey, um, excuse me, Mr. Barnes. Yes. What kind of other dinosaur fossils have you found? Oh, geez. So uh, the ones that I mentioned in the in the talk were myosaurs and uh, phytosaurs. And phytosaurs are technically not dinosaurs, but they were around the same time and much bigger than dinosaurs. But I also found uh, some of the big dinosaurs. So fragments of teeth and, and entire portions of teeth of the ones you typically hear about, like uh, Tyrannosaurus and ty you know, Tyrannosaurus rex and, and a, uh, a close relative. Yes, tiny arms. Yeah, tiny arms, a close relative of T-Rex, also uh, uh, named Albertosaurus from Alberta, Canada. Um, and actually uh, lots and lots of uh, eggs of different kinds. So you know, when I was maybe a, a little bit older than most of you guys, I, maybe it was, I was in, uh, uh, in between middle and high school, and I, I had, I don't know, a hundred different species of different fossil eggs, mostly because I had written to people from around the world, and they had, and they had provided, they had mailed it to me, but some of them I went out there and found myself, so uh, lot, lots of different species, so predators and, and uh, um, 
uh, herbivores and omnivores as well, all different kinds. Wow. Also, um, sir, to Mr. Barnes, <clears throat> to be the same thing with Phytosaurus, it's like the Megalodon because the Megalodon is technically not actually a dinosaur, but it was around the dinosaur age as well, like the Phytosaurus. Yeah, totally. And uh, maybe you've heard of Spinosaurus. Oh, yes. Is... I have a, I have a, a dinosaur dictionary. Um, I'll go get it if I show you that. I'll go get it. Cool. Too. Yeah, Spinosaurus, the, the great thing about, oh, I'm gonna, I think he ran away, but anyways, I do have something important to say about Spinosaurus. Here's, here's the dictionary I have. Right. I, um, the Spinosaurus is found in this one. Uh, where is it? It's one of the carnivores, of course. Oh, long necks, it's close to the long necks. Carnivorous dinosaurs, all right. Dinosaurs, spine. Overactor, nope. Baryonyx, Topsaurus. Here it is, Spinosaurus. Wow, yeah, that's that's what Spinosaurus looks like. If you if you go and, and Google Spinosaurus and look at some of the more uh, current uh, versions of how it, its its head looks, you'll see that there are actually, um, there's sometimes, there are skulls of, phyto, of the Spinosaurus that looks like a Phytosaur. And they're actually, their heads are pretty similar because uh, it's funny that when they, they started looking at Spinosaurus and they thought it was a land dinosaur like T-Rex. And later on, they began to think, well, maybe it was in the water. Like, like you're saying, you know, uh, you know a, a type of a shark. Maybe it was something in between. Maybe it was a dinosaur that went in the water and, and that's probably why it had a head, just like this, this phytosaur that I've got right, right back here, because you know, this part is like a, a big ball. It's easier to catch a, a fish or something in your jaw if you have got these big spiky teeth that, that act like sort of a hand, you know, it's, it sort of grabs around a fish for you. So, so yeah, that's, it's funny, but phytosaurs actually look like spinosaurs probably because of that reason. Cool. I'm glad you like. I'm like, glad you like spinosaurus. Thank you. Yeah, I also like this. Also, sir, um, I can't believe it, but all three dinosaurs on this page are even bigger than us. Oh, Look yeah. at the sizes compared to humans. Exactly. There's, I mean, there's just there's so many things that even even more recently, there's so many different animals that are way bigger than humans. Like in the in the Pleistocene, there there were ground sloths. I don't know if you have ever been to the Harvard Museum, but they have a they have a few from uh, from recent periods. They're just gigantic, and it's 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 amazing that they're so big. Okay. Also, so I just wanted to show you one thing. Okay. Come on, the Brachiosaurus. It's like super humongous. Look at the size. Wow. Yeah. That's that's an impressive one, and I, I wish I had more time in this talk. I had uh, at the very beginning, I, I showed one slide that had in it some uh, sauropod eggshells, and and actually those are are pretty am amazingly big for uh, comparison to let's say a, a a chicken egg. So I'll just quickly share my screen again. I, I have this already up on the screen. But okay. if you see here, this this eggshell on my fingers is a it's a, a, a chicken eggshell, and it's compared to uh, one of these giant sauropod eggs. It's a really really big difference. Like that that the thickness of that little chicken eggshell compared to this giant sauropod egg, it's very very big difference. So yeah, I, wow. I like the big I like the big sauropods too. Okay. Well, sir, it was great learning from you. I had a great. really good time. Thank you. I, I appreciate you coming on these calls. Th thank you very much for, for coming today. Thank you, sir. And I'm glad I learned from you. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. You too. Okay, I'm signing. For everybody else who's left, I'm going to sign off now. Thank, thank you for staying till the very bitter end. Thank you. Thank you very much.